Folks, we are gliding silkily into our second hour of friction-free frolic. You have to trace it all the way back. <laughs> you know what? I actually don't. Oh, you pay his health insurance? These are my sponsors. I'll behave. You're on with Brent Ziff, and I'm... Why'd you call me? What are we doing here? I've been dreaming of answering this question for two years. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on. What's your... I, what, what? I feel the earth, Brent. In through the nose, out through the mouth. Today, our leverage beats everyone else's. What leverage? What could you possibly be talking about? We are not here to talk about John Carpenter, although we could go. go for days. Oh. <laughs> Uh, but we're here to talk about uh, First Time Caller, um, now, which is based on the uh, podcast, uh, The Earth Moves, yeah? Right. Um, which That's I was correct. unfamiliar with, uh, but I'm going to check it out now. But why don't you start at the start and tell me how the podcast came together and how, okay. uh, and how that turned into a feature. Okay, definitely. Well, I, I, I could definitely uh, speak to at least the podcast piece and uh, turn it over to JD as we... Uh, Get into the the feature aspect of it, but um, uh, you know, in the in the early days of the pandemic, I guess like like late spring of of, of the pandemic, you know, no, nobody was working on any on anything like uh, obviously TV, film, theater, or whatever. A, and Abe um, Abe, you know, was at home with no. He got in touch with me and he said, uh, uh, like fiction podcast because he because I have a background with writing and producing, uh, writing and producing uh, science fiction podcasts. I've been doing that for a number of years now. Um, and I know Abe from just my particular corner uh, of Abe Goldfarb, the co-director and star of the film. I know him going back to um, uh, my indie independent theater days in New York. Um, and we we collaborated on projects before. Abe had uh, previously directed a, 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 a screenplay that I wrote uh, called The Horror Gallery K, uh, uh, which is a, 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 a small indie that I, um, and uh, um, which was which was a bit more horror geared, but he basically called me up and said, "I'd love to do this. And just make it a two hander with another actor that he and I are both close friends with and longtime collaborators with. His name is Brian Silliman, who's the voice you hear on the phone uh, throughout the film, playing the role of Leo Short." Um, and he said, "My only idea is this: I, I, I'm picturing a call in radio host." who gets a call from someone telling him that the world is about to end. He said, I don't know if this guy is from the future or if there's some other way that he knows, but he's right. And it basically follows their conversation as the call-in host starts to realize he's right. So Abe just gave me that and I ran with it. And I, you know, I started trying to think of like, you know, a really outlandish direction that we could take it in, but that would still feel like a very emotionally true relationship and i started thinking about the idea well, okay if these are this is, our, if our characters are two men let's kind of explore the kind of very weird kind of standoffish uh slowly thawing way that uh at least american men make friends you know they, they, they may be different around the world but uh but the but, but the way that that, that the grown men very very slowly and weirdly make new friends which uh, is not a process that grown men that had before in their life if they have any and the thing about leo shorter calls in is he doesn't have any he just has this radio host brent zip that he's always worshipped so I, I wrote it and my my own podcast company which has produced um some successful podcasts that i've written um including steal the stars and a few other shows um my co my colleagues at that company gideon media uh they agreed to produce it and it and released it as two-part fiction podcast um uh, and then abe wanted very much to move go on and adapt it to a feature film and uh, in the process of figuring out how to do that he connected with uh the synodata folks including uh, uh jd who can pick up the story from here and say uh, how things progressed uh, jd you're up so yeah so uh my producing partner patrick terry uh he also kind of knew abe through the theater world he actually hosted uh, one of Patrick produces this uh, variety and magic show in New York called Wonder Show, uh, which usually has a very irreverent host of which Abe Goldfarb was uh, of 
one that I actually kind of helped film. And so I met Abe through, through that. And uh, Patrick had asked Abe about kind of material that he, he had that was producible on a low, a low budget. And our company was looking for projects like that. And Abe told us about this podcast and we were, we were hooked. Um, I actually listened to it for the first time. I live in Santa Barbara and I listened to it on a drive at night from Santa Barbara to Los Angeles. And it really was kind of like one of those like war of the world, absurdist war of the world, um, like the Orson Welles broadcast, you know, like could really imagine it in my, in my head in that uh, nighttime environment. And yeah, we immediately saw the potential and, uh, yeah, a Abe wanted to direct it himself initially, um, but we persuaded him since he was in every shot that you know <laughs> uh, maybe maybe he could have a co-director, and uh, we 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 talked about it and we found we actually had a pretty good shared vision for for the piece, and yeah, planned it all out together, and it uh, it was a great experience. Because it is really uh, well directed in that, like, we've had a lot of pandemic era films where it's like, uh, it's mediated through the screen, or it's, you know, a couple people in a room, uh, which mm -hmm. can put real constraints on your visual style. And you guys have managed to to not fall into that trap, like you've managed to, like, push the edges of like, how you're displaying the information, how you're filming Abe. Um, uh, how you're uh, sort of cutting to briefly like outside information, how you're conveying the, the wider world of the film. Um, how did you approach that? Like, was there like a, a design thesis? Was there an aesthetic in mind? Was it uh, sort of improvisational based on like what was available? Like, hit me with it. I mean, yeah, there were certain sort of feasibility factors for sure. But I think a big thing that we did at the outset is, um, uh, even though the script is sort of one continuous scene, we were very um, specific in sort of subdividing it into these, you know, different uh, different scenes that had kind of their own little arcs to them and finding, you know, the visual style that reflected uh, that state of mind for, their, for Brent. And, you know, and then from within that, we kind of, you know, did uh, try to keep it interesting, shall we say? The there the 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 nature of the collaboration was, uh, for instance, Abe really wanted to do like split screens, and I was generally into that idea, but I wanted to sort of introduce it organically, and so that's where the notion of sort of having the screen come into frame using the architecture as as a wipe, you know, in an early scene in the film. When, when Leo's call starts. And then, um, yeah, and then sort of from, you know, from our sub scene to sub scene, figuring out uh, a distinct visual style. You know, we, we wanted the language of the film to evolve. And even the, the sort of the last sequence of the film is basically, a, is basically silent, you know, aside uh, sound effects. So, um, yeah, you know, we definitely were conscious of of that we had to keep it engaging. I think the script really like pulls you along an incredible amount. Um, I think the script does the heavy lifting. And one thing that maybe Mac you can speak to in uh, going from the podcast to the film, we we expanded mm -hmm. it a bit, you know, and there were mm -hmm. we added more characters. I don't know if Mac you want to talk about. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, because one thing I, you know, I knew from having worked with Abe on a previous uh, film where the script that I wrote was very stagey, um, uh, and which was specifically what he asked for when I was writing it, the, the horror at Gallery K, the, the, um, the previous film we worked on. I knew from that that Abe is is wonderful at at finding ways of taking a stagey script and making it visual. But what blew my mind with First Time Caller is obviously in collaboration with JD, like it was just kind of, I was astonished at what an added visual dimension there was to it. 
um, you know, that like it constantly felt like I was watching a sparkling cinematic thing, even though it's one room, one visual actor. But part of what was needed in order to make it make the leap from podcast to feature film was uh, the, the podcast, the two episodes together came out to about an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, uh, you know, in, in order to hit feature film length, uh, uh, we, we needed some more stuff in there. And, uh, um, uh, and Abe came to me with the idea, I don't know if, if he discussed it with you first, J.D., or not, but he came to me with the idea of, like, let's hear a few other callers. On the podcast, you only hear Leo. It's just a, two, a tight two-hander between the two of them. And it's like, you know, nobody, that let, no one that would be on the phone with Brent enough to eclipse Leo. Leo needs to be the main other, you know, character in the story. But to basically set the stage for, like, what kind of show it is um, and for... Uh, um, how Brent relates to people, like kind of to get to know who Brent is before he goes through this incredible humbling process mm -hmm. over the course of the remainder of the story. So those uh, that that first ten or twelve minutes of uh, phone calls from his like usual from the kind of people he normally talks to, that stuff wasn't in the podcast, but it was great fun to figure it out. He gave he was like, let's see a couple of the types of people that he talks to. Let's see how he talks to them. Let's have it be a mix of like new people and you see how quickly Brent zeroes in on their vulnerabilities mm. um, or how quickly he makes fun of them for the entertainment uh, of his listeners um, and, uh, or some recurring people that he has a long running relationship with and that really helped actually enhance something that was adding those scenes enhanced something that was core to the podcast it was like it was core to my understanding of Brent's character which is Brent is just a couple of rungs above the people who call in and he makes fun of them. <laughs> Brent was a loser not very long ago. He was another one of these dorks who's like, you know, mooning over, um, oh, oh, I'm blanking on her name from Real Genius um, um, uh, that you guys got the pictures of. Uh, oh, uh, Mayring. Uh, Michelle, Michelle Mayring. Yeah. Yes. Ever and like other 90s, uh, 1980s, you know, famous, uh, 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 you know, famous sex symbol women from the 1980s and stuff like that. And and um, and when these people call in, he knows that if if just a couple differences in luck, if his life took a couple of slightly different turns, he would be one of those schlubs who's calling in. So that he knows he needs them for his audience, but he also knows he kind of has to mash them down so he can stand on top of them. So he he knows how how close he is to having been them before, and that if a couple things go wrong, he could be them again, which kind of makes him sneer at them all the more. He needs guys like Leo; they're his bread and butter. But he also makes fun of them, and um, and you know they and his callers want attention from him so badly that. Um, uh, you know, they'll call in and even be yelled at uh, just, you know, to hear their voices on the radio, to hear their hero talk to them. And that sort of helped uh, clarify who Brent is. And then over so over the course of the story, as events kind of like bring him to this uh, to this humbled place of to whatever degree of self-knowledge a person like Brent Ziv can reach. Um, uh, but what the one that helped immensely was with the added character of um, of Brainiac, who we hear from twice. Uh, uh, a long time and you get to see how Brent treats him. You learn a lot about who Brent is from how he treats him. We give away almost no personal details of Brent's life, so we have to learn about him from how he treats them. Adding those extra calls was fantastic. Like, you know, at first I was worried that it would dilute the purity of the two-hander conversation from the podcast, but instead it was it revealed so much more about the central character and by extension so much more about leo i thought it was fantastic that uh, uh, uh abe's idea and potentially uh, jd had input into that as well and i'm very grateful for that but in addition as i said at the beginning of this answer for just how much of an of a vibrant visual addition they had to the story that never made me feel feel like i was watching a filmed play or a filmed podcast Mm, yeah, and I think you need the the context of his interactions with his audiences because, like, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, viewer identification, we need some empathy for Brent, mm -hmm. but we also yeah. need some some sort of Schadenfreude uh, you know, <laughs> to to plug into the humbling process, right? Like, you've got to yeah, see sure. how he behaves to uh, to have his journey have meaning, if that makes sense. I think it does. absolutely, absolutely, yeah. definitely. Why the decision to set it in that particular 
cultural corner of uh, of internet culture why the uh the right wing kind of is it is it manosphere is it just like sh general shock jockery like what, what why that particular well, there was, i wouldn't say it's necessarily oh, I, like I, fully the right wing sphere uh, matt go ahead with with your sort of Oh, sorry. I guess I was about. I, was, I you could. I was going to say basically the same thing. Now I was in a, a situation where, um, you know, I had started work on this, and not long after, I was hired for a different project that involved uh, a, 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 a right wing radio host. And I was like, okay, I want to make sure I sharply differentiate first time caller from the from that other project. Where on that show, the guy was in like firebrand. It was like really into like. Uh, the hard right wing politics of American culture. I thought it might be interesting to differentiate Brent by leaning him into. I guess you know you kind of did say it, the manosphere thing. He's mm. a pickup artist host. His his whole thing is, uh, and a, which definitely has overlaps with right wing culture in the yeah. United States. Uh, but it, uh, it it sort of runs along a parallel track and sometimes overlaps. It's the whole seduction seduction masters like these. There's a there's a whole culture of these like seduction gurus who sort of like teach hapless men who are who, who can't seem to get dates or you know can't can't figure out how to talk to women and basically teach them you can be these masters of seduction you can you can actually you know get you know get women to be fall under your spell and be submissive to you and you can and it sort of flatters um it flatters a certain kind of socially awkward male um uh ego to think that like um rather than you know going from schlub who doesn't know how to talk to women to ordinary person who just has basic social skills and could go on dates and have a pleasant conversation they're going to skip that part and go straight to casanova they're going to become a master <laughs> of seduction and um you know and i think brent Br you know brent obviously his sh different people call in with different topics so brent does cover a range of topics including stuff about politics but his main focus is the seduction thing which is why you know he's just about to hang up on leo early on until uh, uh until leo says now there's this girl and brent is like okay there's a girl now we're having a brent ziff conversation uh, what, were you, what were you going to say, JD? Oh, I was just going to say that there, there's definitely some incels in in Brent's mm -hmm. audience for sure, and um, I was just going to call out um, kind of the main influence for me in thinking about Brent was there's there is a um, radio host named Tom Lycus from you know the late '80s through early aughts, and you know he was on uh, LA radio and just spewing out this this nonsense <laughs> so you know this i was like well these guys are have been around a long time yeah, they're so. out there they're out there yeah. <laughs> um so when i first sat down to watch it um i had a couple of films in mind that are kind of like the concept reminded me of you know kind of basically movies about djs um which was uh all the stones talk radio i think that's a that's a pretty obvious uh touch point uh the canadian Definitely horror film a kind of linguistic horror film Pontypool mm -hmm. yeah which Love is that. an ab absolute banger um but as I watched it uh what I was really reminded of and Mac you'll know this um is Miracle Mile oh yeah 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 the, the Anthony Michael Hall when he's uh, yeah. trying to get in touch with uh yeah yeah gosh it's been decades but I have seen that yeah 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 um I have not Oh, JD, that's uh, a guy who's like on a date um, in LA and has a really nice date. And then when he's heading home, uh, he goes past a, a ringing phone booth. Like there's just a phone booth ringing and he answers the phone and it's someone from a nearby military base. And he's like, the fucking missiles are in the air. Like I was, I, I, I'm just trying to get the oh, word. Yeah, like, yeah, it's, I've it's heard, yeah, on. yeah, I'm, a, I'm aware of it. I haven't seen yeah. it, but it's and, on and the top of the list right now right, do it do it great film really weird ending great film um mm -hmm. but it, it deals with this idea which i think you guys do um like when the apocalypse comes like we're, we're kind of just gonna be in the middle of our lives we're just gonna be <laughs> whatever, whatever the fuck we do and then suddenly we're gonna have to grapple and and try and 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 internalize this sudden knowledge that like oh, all this is going away uh given the current Parlous state of the world. I think <laughs> this is a very timely thing to be dealing with. I wonder if you guys can dig into that for me. Maybe uh, tell me what you were thinking about when uh, when these story elements came together. Oh, uh, do you, do you Max, want me to start? Go yeah, go well, for it. it, go it, for it. it. 
Well, obviously, the apocalypse element was uh, was to some degree baked in, just you know, from Abe's original, you know, because and obviously in the early days of the uh, uh, of the COVID pandemic, that would you know that kind of thing was on everybody's mind. I mean, you know, I think you know, I think we all certainly hoped that it was the end of the world, but I think you know we were like we didn't know. If you remember back to the earliest days, we just had no idea how bad it was going to be, mm. how long it was going to last, and. Um, you know, so the, there was definitely a lot of apocalypse in the air. Uh, but when it came time to sort of think about, um, you know, I, I, uh, like what it would be um, specifically for this, you know, it was one of those things where I, I, I kind of hit on the idea of like, you know, because I know Abe had suggested uh, that maybe a time traveler from the future, a post of when the post apocalypse comes back and says the world's going to end. But I liked the idea of like a total nobody, like basically having taken on a hobby uh uh that ended up giving him secret knowledge into nature and i liked the i wanted the apocalypse to be something that basically made a guy like brett ziff who has blown himself up to this enormous mythology with his there's his own little corner of the entertainment world where he feels like he's like a titan of his own little tiny sphere that that would that would be a tremendously humbling thing that it would be it would be a pro the apocalypse would be coming about due to a geologic process that had been very slowly about to happen for millennia and was far beyond the scope of any human life uh, that was now bringing all of Brent's uh, uh, dreams to a uh, close. And I was, I, I, one thing, you know, I grew up, you know, I read Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde probably younger than I should. And one of the cornerstones of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is that the, 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 the serum or potion that he comes up with that turns him into Mr. Hyde um, or, uh, or, or that he has to drink to turn back into Dr. Jekyll when he doesn't want to be Mr. Hyde anymore. Uh, it works for a while. Then the first batch runs out. He tries to make more and he realizes he made a mistake the first time. And the mistake is what made the potion work. And with it, so I wanted the, the particular apoc apocalypse in this story to be something um, deeply humbling and something that would be bizarrely connected to this, you know, the, to this total nobody of a guy. But again, uh, uh, the way that they, uh, the way that JD and Abe realized it in the movie uh, 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 completely blew my mind. I saw that you brought up uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde because um, Sydney Theatre Company did a fantastic stage adaptation last year, which I reviewed and, and interviewed the, the, the director and, and cast for. And it's a two, it's a two hander. It's just. Uh, oh, no kidding. Yeah, so one guy is playing um, Jekyll's mate, you know, the point of view character, mm -hmm. whose name is Scotty at the moment. And the other oh, guy... Utterson, is, I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Utterson. Um, And the other guy is playing Jekyll and Hyde and every single other character in the narrative through a combination wow. of, like, onstage screens, live video, pre-recorded video, mirrors to make the one actor appear multiple mm -hmm. times on stage at the same time. It's amazing. Oh, awesome. What we thought about visually with with the story of um, Leo's, you know, uh, unrequited love um, is we wanted to sh have representative imagery. And, uh, you know, that's where some of the uh, the 80s hotties, you know, uh, <laughs> Brent's kind of imagining of that story was just like, well, let's just cut to like, let's just cut to that to put, you know, a picture in the that audience. That was so amazing. Find. And yeah, so um, yeah, it was just a process of, of figuring out um, best way to visually heighten things um, in ways like that. The, your incorporation of Michelle Mayrink into the into the visual fabric of the story was incredible. I know it's quite <laughs> difficult for you all to like license those images to use in the film, uh, but they added an incredible. It wasn't too bad, but, but, but we made a point to license them. You know, we we knew that uh, that was going to that was going to be a problem if we didn't. So because it was so right. central, and, and it added so much to that scene because it's not just you all didn't just use it to show to like to show audience members which actor they're talking about, you know, because like some people grew up on Real Genius and some people, you know, the, uh, who might be a bit younger, maybe didn't grow up on it. And like, you know, obviously it was very formative for me, but so it wasn't just like, but then you all kept going back to those images in ways that helped illustrate Leo's story about the woman who kind of like first got him. And it added this without adding, without showing any other characters, just the way that you all 
incorporated those those skills from real genius into it by carefully panning over them, added this wonderful uh, visual and emotional undercurrent to the film that I just marvel at every time I watch it. I think you all just did so, such an amazing job with that. That's kind of the full... But that's kind of all we can really talk about without giving away too much of the film, really, I feel. Um, so I guess so, I'll just ask... It's tricky with this movie. It is, it is, because it mm. is deceptively simple. Uh, but it is a film where I feel the less you know going in, the better time you're going to have with it. Um, <laughs> but I also, I also, having watched it twice now, I know that uh, it rewards uh, repeat viewing, so that's good. So many films do not. Uh, but what I will ask Thank is, you. Um, off, off the back of this, uh what's up next for you guys are you planning further collaborations uh are we are you going to be like stepping further out of the, the podcast and and sort of uh, uh audio drama zone and into more more screen stuff like uh what's on your radar oh well i i'll answer for myself and, and turn it over to jd i i i'm definitely um you know I, i'm incredibly happy with first time caller so uh if not if you know if an opportunity came up to collaborate with the Senate data folks again i'd be extremely interested to do that we haven't had a chance to have conversations about that but i'm just so very happy uh uh, uh with the work they've done i've i've been very busy it's so weird you know because i've worked most of the gigs i get are in audio drama it's been very odd because it's as, you, as I'm sure you know, there's been a, a multi, several month now writer's strike uh, in the United States, uh, the, the WGA union, and then more recently an actor's strike added to mm -hmm. that. Um, uh, uh, but um, but because I'm, I'm not a union writer yet, and because I write mostly audio dramas, it's very odd. I've been able to continue working while so many of my colleagues haven't. Uh, I've been getting, you know, I've been able to still get audio drama gigs because they're kind of handled differently uh mm -hmm. under uh, under um union regulations uh, i mean some of them you can't do but some of them you can't uh so i end up getting i end up doing so much audio stuff that i sometimes find it hard to find time to work on film and television stuff more recently i've been really carving out time to try to like get into that more because as you say like audio sometimes is a bit of a comfort zone and i'm so happy with how first time caller came out is that you know it, i've been emboldened to want to try to write some more scripts that were originally envisioned for you know for the screen um and uh, uh so i've definitely been but i do definitely have um a number of audio projects coming out i'm, I'm always keeping busy with that it's very odd the joke i'd say to people is like uh, I've been working a job for five years that didn't exist six years ago. It's a weird. I've, I've been get. I've been writing fiction podcasts for a living. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I, I am definitely, in answer to your question, interested in in trying um, trying to write some original uh, uh, content for the screen like that. Principally because I'm so happy with what uh, Abe and JD have accomplished uh, uh, with this film. Uh, so we'll see how that goes, and I'll I'll turn it over to uh, JD for his plans. Uh, well, I'm I'm excited to read that uh, that next script, and and we we can talk more. Um, uh, as for for me and my my company, Cinedata, we we kind of describe ourselves as as we do we do um, we love sci-fi and sci not fi. Um, we actually do a lot of documentary work. Uh, I, I've been the kind of filmmaker in residence at uh, Google's quantum computing research lab which is, you know, truly an incredible place with lots of, you know, things you think would not be possible happening all around you. And uh, yeah, so been um, working on uh, that. Are they working on a, a Google search, which won't just give me about 30 goddamn ads before I get what I want? <laughs> like Eventually it'll all be integrated, <laughs> AI, that, the Bard. Yes. Um, yeah, we'll see what, we'll see what, we'll see what paths bard sends you down um but all the quantum computing stuff is still uh we're still many years off from it kind of having any practical applications mm. um but theoretically a lot a lots of amazing things uh anyway so that's that's another side of uh uh of my work but yeah similarly developing some projects excited to read what uh what Abe's writing, and uh, I've been working on a script with a, a, a co-writer friend of mine, and also sort of seeking out material. It's been great, like I said, awesome film. Really glad I saw it. Really glad I talked to you guys, and uh, 
honestly can't wait to see what you do next because that really impressed the hell out of me. That's awesome. Little. Oh, thank you so much. And when I say little, I just mean like, you know, the like I, that's not a diminutive, even though it sounds like it. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Appreciate uh, it. Low budget, so high concept, thing. well made, exactly what I want. Marvelous. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Good luck with the yeah, fest. We're, we're very grateful for the time. Yeah. 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 Best of luck uh, uh, next week. Looking forward to hearing about it. All right. Groovy.